So it wasn't, uh, it was it's very convenient to, to come over here. Uh, it was interesting to hear the talks, <clears throat> I'm sorry, from, from, uh, from the ICM on, on ATVN. And uh, you know, you'll, you'll see a lot of duplication, and uh, especially from uh, Monsieur Gauthier's talk, uh, some of his slides are a lot better than mine, and we're addressing the same subjects. But you'll see that uh, a, a fairly large American corporation uh, and our experience in, in seven years of actually doing internet streaming and making a business out of it, uh, we've learned very similar things that uh, people here in academia or in the EEC would, uh, are, are learning again. Uh, we operate um, worldwide, obviously mostly in the U.S., but uh, we are we have activities all over Europe, and uh, uh, following me, uh, Machi Kolotiak will will uh, give some demonstrations on uh, some of the future applications. He has some nice toys to show, and he represents our interests uh, in Eastern Europe. Uh, we've had various. Uh, appearances or various aspects uh, in, in the earlier talks of uh, what uh, people are trying to do, whether it's the practical demonstrations here of the people of the, the science network or, uh, you know, following my talk, uh, I, I would say probably the best uh, outer, the best enterprise in the world that's using streaming and most of it is uh, real network streaming, is the BBC. They have uh, done a tremendous job, I think better than we have ourselves, in uh, putting content together for, the, for more than five years. Uh, what internet streaming is, uh, is the notion of being a broadcaster. At least in the US, a lot of people think that uh, there's uh, there, there's no difference between being a broadcaster and uh, the numerous other methods that people use the internet for communication. Um, a question I get a lot is, can we use your stuff for video conferencing? Uh, and uh, it, perhaps someday, but uh, that is not the, the goal. The goal is what we've been talking about here, where someone is producing content for, to be consumed by people in their homes, or people at their offices not for one-to-one -one communication. Uh, another use of, um, say, audio or video on the net is uh, IP telephony. Uh, and of course, everybody knows about email and instant messaging, which is uh, the main use of the internet. Uh, so we try to compare ourselves to traditional media, and those are the ones listed there, radio, TV, uh, print media, uh, the web itself, uh, uh, large corporate media, that, that would be uh, cinema and uh, music. Uh, but against traditional media, uh, what we can see that uh, internet streaming is about the most democratic way of getting media out. Just as someone can go and for essentially no money produce their own website and if they spend enough time on it make a very good website, uh, you can get into the broadcasting business for, at least in a, on a small scale, you can get into it for essentially no money. You don't need to apply for a license as you would if you were setting a transmitter up. Uh, you don't need a lot of equipment. You can even do it from a website. And, you know, just magically by sitting in your house, even over a, over a modem, I've spent uh, many years on, not on broadband, but just on plain old modems. Uh, doing this stuff, and you can make your make these things available worldwide. So you know what is it? it just as uh, Monsieur Gautier was trying to say, what what do people want when you're when you're going after their short attention span and that little piece of their 24 hours? And what Wojciech was showing. Uh, it's the success of, on, of the on-demand clips as opposed to live. The, the main point of the web or internet streaming is, the, is that people can do what they want when they want to do it. They want to sit there and click and 
they don't want to look at the newspaper and say, uh, you know, I'm going to watch the news at 6 o'clock because ABC is showing the news. Uh, so it's, it's all on demand. The, the, the timing is dictated by the users and not by a television network or a radio network. Um, we are seeing s s some back migration of these ideas to more traditional technologies. In, in the, the U.S. and the U.K., we have something called a TiVo, which is uh, sort of a marriage of a, a video recorder and a computer. And you can tell it, uh, uh, I want to watch the X-Files or, or I want to watch the football game, but you won't be home. So, and it, know, it actually has stored in its memory the entire program of all the channels, all the hundreds of channels on cable. Uh, and it says, okay, I will get the football game at, uh, at 3 o'clock. And you don't have to be home. And it basically turns live TV into on demand. Uh, some of the cable stations are making a gigantic, uh, cable carriers are making gigantic investments to provide pay-per-view, uh, not on a schedule, but on the person's schedule. We're using proprietary uh, technology and, and set-top boxes. So as, as we've, I've, I've been doing uh, streaming over IP for, since 1993. I joined Real Networks in 1995 when Real Audio 1 came out in April. Uh, and I think everybody knows this sort of time scale in terms of um, you know, the business aspects of everything on the internet. And streaming is one of the sort of uh, flashiest things on the internet. The first four years, um, things just happened because uh, it was cool. It was something new and all that mattered is that you got a lot of attention. And, and then the money started to run out. Uh, so in the intermediate period of the past two years, uh, things didn't get that quiet, but uh, people got a little more concerned about uh, doing things if it at least had a commercial prospect. And now, uh, after a lot of uh, financial difficulty and a lot of disappearing uh, companies, uh, there is a much higher standard. And we as a commercial enterprise, uh, since we don't uh, have uh, the EEC behind us, we're just a, a private company with a stock and, 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 and shareholders and, and a bunch of cranky employees. Uh, pe people really, it's interesting, you know, in, when I first got to the company and it was maybe 15 people, people were just, it was just great and everybody's doing things. Now, everybody's a businessman. You know, I'm, I'm just a physics professor by training. I don't know anything about business. I could, I could have a lot of proof of that. But um, everybody, even the, the, the lowest programmer or marketer, all they, all they think about is where's the business in this? You know, so everyone is, instead of being the, the internet kid with the blue jeans playing ping pong is, uh, is very concerned about the business. Um, you know, even though we talk about multimedia and, and different data types and MP4 and, and, and video, uh, the strongest base for uh, streaming on the internet is still radio. There are many thousands of stations. If you just plug a, a, P, a PC in and use the real player or something else, uh, you could get thousands, you know, countless thousands of stations. And because of the democratic nature of the medium, uh, you can get Deutsche Welle or uh, Voice of America. The BBC has, I don't know, dozens of, of live programs. Uh, you can listen to anything, any of their major stations, uh, the World Service in, uh, new, in many languages. You can listen just about anything except uh, Premiership Football, which is really the only thing I want to hear. Uh, uh, you get to listen to that 10 second thing about how they don't have the rights, which is a, uh, a big problem. Um, and of course, regional, local, university stations, and lots of personal stations. Lots of people just say, uh, you know, I want to be in media, and they can't all get jobs at a radio station. The sound quality, since I, I used to be sort of a, a radio, ham radio uh, hobbyist, uh, I, I thought it was a great thing to put a gigantic dipole antenna out when, in my house in Philadelphia and uh, listen to Radio Australia or something like that. And it, it worked pretty well most of the time. 
uh, but it still sounded poor, and it was a lot of effort to set up. If I want to listen to Radio Australia now, I just go to their website, and it sounds great. Even at 16 kilobits a second, uh, you know, radio voice sounds fine. Uh, in the early days of Real Audio, we were doing it at um, 8 kilobits a second, and it wasn't that bad. So even though it's, it's kind of boring and conventional, this is the main, still the, the main present use of streaming. Uh, as we've seen in you know, several of the, the earlier talks, uh, one of the things you give up when you're competing with traditional media with internet streaming is that every additional audience member causes another 20 kilobits, 32 kilobits of bandwidth that you have to pay for. Uh, you know, the traditional media has a high cost of entry you, to go set up a radio tower on top of a building and, and get your licenses and build all the fixed facilities. But if 10 people listen or a million people listen, it doesn't change your cost. Uh, a big problem in, in the U.S. and in other places is the, the licensing puzzle. Just so, just because I, as I cannot listen to uh, the Premiership Games in... Uh, in the UK, uh, there, there's a ton of content that people really want that we can't provide and, and our customers can't provide uh, because the movie companies, the music companies, the sports leagues uh, don't really understand the medium. They don't understand the personal medium and they, they basically say, oh, you're just like a radio station. We're going to charge you the millions of dollars we charge CBS or something to, to have show a football game. Uh, this is getting better. In particular, the sports people are are the most cooperative with us. Uh, we have some co op it, It's getting a lot better as they understand it. But um, the rights holders, particularly the music companies, are very, very scared because of the Napster stuff. Um, I mentioned multicast, and I saw that the, uh, the gentleman from uh, the University of Westminster will be talking more about it, so I'll go fast through this. Uh, it's not so much a technical thing, but multicast is a method by which you can get around that problem of having to pay for the incremental user. Unfortunately, multicast on the internet doesn't exist. I mean, there's something called the M-Bone, which works in a few universities, but in, essentially multicast is something that the, the IP carriers don't like because they have no way of charging for it. They, they make less money off of it. Um, so it's, it doesn't really happen. But what's, what's interesting about multicast is it's, it's not new. Uh, it's not a research project. Uh, radio and television as we know it are multicast. Okay, multicast has been around for more than 82 years in, in the commercial regime. When this little station in Pittsburgh set up the, uh, the election results, uh, they were doing multicast. When, you know, when, uh, when Marconi was sending sparks across the Atlantic, that, that was also multicast. Anybody who turned on the appropriate receiver would get it. It wouldn't bother him at all. Um, another, as we go through the history of streaming media, uh, a lot of people have, in including myself and, and everybody in the business, have been hung up on the notion of proprietary standards and real standards. And that comes down to formats, protocols, and codecs, file formats, uh, streaming protocols, whether it's RTP, HTTP, uh, you know, this whole alphabet soup of, of things, and the codecs, what you, the, the mathematical system of compression. Uh, I would say that as the whole industry matures, this is getting to be somewhat overrated and more of a commodity. Uh, the, the combination of the market forces, uh, the culture of the internet where people don't like to be bullied around, and overall economics is, is leading to a, a convergence. And um, Real Networks as a business welcomes that because we've always been a, a much more uh, open as far as uh, what you use uh, our system with. We're not trying to sell an operating system. We're not, uh, we, we have no agenda other than having you use our products for streaming. So now there are de facto standards. There's, there's not nearly as many file formats. The protocols are, you can count on one hand. And you know, we work with uh, sometimes competitors like Apple and um, academia and come up with standards such as the uh, the, my, 
Smile, which is a markup, HTML-like markup language for presentations, which I think Mr. Halls will talk about, and RTSP and RTP. Uh, one thing that was mentioned in an earlier talk was the, the notion of streaming and versus download, where download isn't necessarily real time. And what we've had a lot of the time is people would say, well, QuickTime looks a lot better. If you go to a lot of movie sites, you, they frequently will, you, uh, because of the uh, relationship of artists with Apple, they use QuickTime for encoding. And they have these gigantic, like 10, 10 meg trailers that run two minutes. Uh, and you, it takes you an hour to download it to watch the two minutes. But the quality is fantastic because the bit rate is over a megabit. Uh, so people say, well, streaming is lousy. Streaming is not what I really want to do. I want to, you know, I'm going to use QuickTime, but then you can't really do an entertainment that way if you have to wait an hour or wait 45 minutes to get a couple of minutes. Uh, so Real Network's uh, response to this is what our version 9 of our, our entire product line, which uh, someone, somebody in marketing renamed as Helix, and Basically, it, it, will, it gets over that problem of these different formats and codecs um, uh, fighting with each other. In the past, be before, uh, you know, until very recently, uh, it, as you heard of the, the ATVN, they, they, they hope in the future to, to cover the major formats and video, not just ours. I'm not thrilled about that, but you know that's that's life. Uh, but we have people, uh, major providers, that are going through a lot of effort to encode all of their material in multiple formats and serve it from different servers to hit the different end users, usually over PCs. So basically, it's a, a big pain in the neck because you're running multiple parallel infrastructures. There's some movie studios that. that I've never seen anybody run all four, but certainly it's very common to see people run the, t the first two and sometimes the first three. And they're running three kinds of servers and talking to different kinds of PCs and things. And it's, uh, it, it makes something that's already pretty expensive um, uh, impossibly disorganized. So uh, what we're doing with the, uh, the Helix server is uh, you can set up one machine, which can be very cheap, uh, you know, just a Linux box, and it will serve all of the, the known formats to all of the usual players. So you can, uh, you can encode in Win with your Min Windows Media encoder and serve it off our server to any of, the, uh, any of the players on any of the platforms that know how to do that. Uh, so th this is one thing that uh, is, is hard to grasp when you're looking at, at, at you know, interesting small academic programs or even governmental supported programs. We've been in business for seven years and have spent in excess of $200 million to build this, uh, this architecture, to build the framework by which people can run their own radio stations or TV stations. Um, I would say that would be very, even though I'm a huge supporter of uh, free software and, and academia, it's, it's unlikely that this kind of funding would come out of uh, just from the ground, from the ground up. Uh, and I've, I've described how we work with all the different devices and things. Um, just in the past two months, we've extended this to uh, release the uh, core software that enables the production and the streaming and the playing of streaming media to the the open source community, the people on the internet that like to play around with code. Now, the reason we did that was not because it was cool. The reason we did it is because we know that the future of streaming is not necessarily people sitting in front of PCs and clicking on things. The future is um, uh, small devices like you'll see, the, the set-top boxes, lots of things. And we had many programs at Real Networks uh, we were almost acting like a research grant agency supporting all these different uh, devices and it was we couldn 't do it there were i mean just supporting Nokia Nokia comes out with dozens of phone phone models per year, and we had a, a, a group supporting them and it was impossible 
to, you know, it would basically spend all the money of the company and we would still not be able to get support all of those platforms. So with Helix Community, we just say, okay, here's the code. You can, you can just go here right now and download the player code and it works. You can compile it and you'll have a basic player. It won't have all the features, but it, you, can, you can play streams. Um, and so we deliver this to our partners who are making set-top boxes and, and mobile players. But anybody can do this, and you can do it without paying us anything. Uh, and basically, there's a license that says, if you make a business out of this, then you have to give us a little bit of money, but uh, you know, not until that time. So now you can go get the player, which is the most interesting part for devices. And we have the encoder and the server are scheduled to be out by the end of this year. The player came out on time, so, uh, which was kind of surprising that software came out on schedule. Uh, and so I'm, you know, I, I expect that they, they will be on schedule, near schedule for the encoder and the server code. Okay, now uh, back to that topic of live versus on demand. People were asking Wojciech, well, you know, when, when are you going to when are you going to do live uh, streaming from lecture halls or whatever content you're doing? Uh, and you know he 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 said that basically it's a it's a resource issue it's not a technical issue and that's correct. Uh, I've done a lot of live streaming. I mean I, I was up, <laughs> I delayed my trip to Warsaw because uh, I'm working on a, a live streaming project in London right now, that, that which uh, should have very easy logistics. But once you get out of your comfortable computer room and your comfortable network, and your nice production studio, uh, the Logistics are almost impossible. You, you have to ha arrange connectivity at the location. You, have, you have to set up wiring. It's, uh, you, you have the problem that, uh, you know, the promotion problem that Mr. Gautier talked about. If there's so much stuff, how do you get people to show up for it? With live content, you have to get people to show up at 10 p.m. because when it's over, it's over. Uh, now. That doesn't mean it's a disaster. It just means you have to recognize that it's the, the expense is probably ten times as much. Uh, one thing that nobody has mentioned here: we've been talking about the internet a lot. One huge uh, uh, win for this kind of technology is to do uh, enterprise communications within a company or within a university or within a university network. Uh, it it can avoid a lot of travel. Um, and we, ha we have uh, many large corporations like Merrill Lynch and Boeing and other companies who used to have media departments that would generate literally thousands of, of VHS tapes for their weekly broadcast. They were, basic, they were pretty much in the, in the shipping business because they would make their little half hour corporate news broadcast and then uh, send out boxes and boxes to all the locations and then the, the tapes would be watched by whoever decided to go to the uh, company communication center, which probably wasn't that many people, and then the, the media centers would mail the tapes back to be re, re recorded. Now, when uh, th these companies have their, their daily broadcasts, they go straight to the desks of the employees. And it's, Major League Baseball is our, our probably biggest uh, offering, and there, there are um, 30 teams that play most days. So that's, uh, and we provide uh, both broadcasts. If it's, if it's Seattle versus Boston, you can listen to the Boston radio person or the Seattle radio person, because obviously they're going to sound different. And this is a huge success in, in, in the U.S. because nobody else has a system where you can literally listen to any, you know, any game that's available. And uh, we've been doing this for two years, and uh, it's worked out very well. We also cover the, uh, all of the games of the National Basketball Association, which is, has almost as many games, uh, in sports car racing, college football. Um, the baseball and basketball have a little bit of an advantage in that we just get, up, get uh, connections with the radio stations and uh, we don't have to change them every time. So we don't have the, the full penalty of logistics of a live broadcast where you have to go in and do everything, do your broadcast and take it all home. Now, in terms of the single events, uh, last fall, uh, in late September, uh, I organized the, the webcast of the U2 concert, which was done in uh, Indiana 
at the Notre Dame University. And we had something like 100,000 people at one time or another listening to this concert. It was a, it was a massive success. We did that in, in conjunction with Tiscali, the uh, European ISP. Uh, another project that, that we did for, for four consecutive years, and this one was a tremendous example in logistics, was the New York Intel Music Festival, where we went into music bars or music clubs in lower Manhattan and had 22 PCs in these dirty clubs, uh, all running at the same time, typically running two streams of, of music. So we would, we would have something about, of about 50 total streams on the internet at the same time, all live and it worked. You can tell we weren't using Windows. Uh, the, and, and this is sort of my, my pet baby uh, project for the last six and a half years. This is the biggest uh, radio station on the internet. It's uh, King FM, the classical station in Seattle. It's been at the same URL essentially for the, for the entire time. So people just bookmark this URL and, and come back. Um, nobody really runs it. I mean, we, we it probably gets uh, one man hour every two months of attention, if that. It just, we just plug it in and it runs on uh, three Linux boxes. Uh, it averages uh, 3,500 at, at the peak of the day. We have 3,500 people listening to it at the same time. Um, the statistics are something like 12,000 listeners a day who average more than two hours of, on a listening session. Uh, the, the, the bandwidth graph for this is, is uh, very interesting. It, it's pretty much the United States uh, office hours. So when the people in New York come to work at about 9 a.m., which is 6 a.m. in Seattle, the bandwidth goes way up, and then it just stays up until the West Coast goes home at around 6 p.m. And at, at night, it's almost not used. But it's a, this and, and some, other, some other of our products just show how uh, this is something nobody had anticipated at first, is that this is people's office radio. And similarly, um, when the tragedy happened in New York last, last September, um, we hit our biggest simultaneous uh, audience ever. We had something like 115,000 people looking at CNN and other things that we carry uh, because they weren't home, right? This happened at 9 a.m. New York time. So uh, they're sitting in their offices. They don't have televisions. They don't have radios. They know something horrible happened. So they all hit the internet because it's right in front of them. And uh, that's the kind of things we can do with this new medium. Okay, so I'm, I'm just about wrapping up here. Um, this is one of my old lines. Uh, being a, a physicist and a chemist and a, and a technology person, I, uh, it was immediately obvious that this isn't really a technology business. Uh, you have to be respectful of what the users want. You have to know, <laughs> you have to be able to uh, adjust your bandwidth and your servers to deal with it. Uh, for instance, in Japan, where we have a, a very large activity, it's, it's in, in some senses, the, our Japanese subsidiary does almost as much internet traffic as the US, uh, and I, I'm very active with them. Uh, because of the way the tariffs, the, the, the charging for bandwidth goes in, in, in Japan, if you look at the bandwidth, it's actually fairly low. There's, there's some bandwidth use during office hours, it goes way down as people are going home. And then at 10 p.m., at 2200, the bandwidth goes up by about a factor of seven. Because at, at 10 p.m., the price of the telephone calls goes down. So we have to carry a tremendous amount of bandwidth to cover that peak. Right now, we're using about 200 megabits a second during that peak in Japan, just to satisfy uh, people on our website, on our streaming, and, and downloading our products. Um, in the USA and Europe, it's not so bad. That the, I mean, the US, the, the, there's no economic advantage to time, just people sleep once in a while. So it just looks like a nice uh, daytime, nighttime graph. Uh, you don't like it, you don't have to sit around and wait for the next half hour for the shows to change. You just say, click, forget it. So the fact that the internet is already more than half of TV, uh, particularly for broadband people, uh, I think that says a lot. It's not, it's not really the medium of the future anymore, it's, it's here. Um, again, uh, uh, Monsieur Gauthier gave, gave a, a very nice graph, one of those PowerPoints with all these things going around, which was basically in pictures what I have here. Uh, Real Networks runs uh, the biggest 
naturally runs the, the biggest uh, broadcast network around. It's called the Real Broadcast Network. And the point of showing you this is not to advertise their service. If you want to broadcast something and don't want to set up servers, you can, you can pay them and they'll do everything or do parts of it. Um, but these are the main parts of getting into the business. You have to get the signal. And in my experience, this is the hardest part uh, because the most things go wrong in signal acquisition. Um, it's so complicated, if, for instance, say in that, that stuff with the sports, like baseball, most of the baseball games that, that we broadcast don't come over digital lines. They come over telephone lines, and then we encode them. So that we have our own t telephone, miniature telephone exchange to, to take in 60 or 80 telephone calls, and then they go into computers, or what's called encoding, uh, to turn that into a, the appropriate digital stream or file. Uh, because we've been around for so long, and because everybody knows that in the computer business, nobody any, ever throws anything away, you have to keep buying hard drives. Uh, fortunately, the economics on that have gotten tremendously better. Uh, just as I showed the, the improvement in the economics for the uh, bandwidth, we've had similar economics on storage, and we can now do for about $5,000 store a terabyte in a RAID 5 array. So in about uh, this much space. Uh, the distribution is the easy part. Running servers, running splitters, they're just Linux boxes running a, a real server, running a Helix server. That's, you know, if, if you can sort out, if you can sort out one and two, which is uh, where you spend all of your time uh, and most of your human money, uh, the rest of it is actually quite easy because uh, even though it's not a technology business, the technology of, of the bottom part is all sorted and, and not that expensive. The, getting the other stuff done doesn't scale the same way. So the future of this is not people sitting in front of Windows rebooting every hour. Uh, you wouldn't want to reboot, your, if you, you wouldn't put up with your telephone if you have to reboot it every hour, and you wouldn't put up with your car if it just basically forgot where it was when you're going down the highway. Um, or if something got into the petrol and uh, just made it not work until, unless you took the whole thing apart and put it back together again. We have a deal with Nokia, Real Networks does, where you know, every new phone that has the capability of, of doing video has a real player in it. So there will be, in the next couple of years, there will be millions of real players walking around in people's pockets especially when these things get small enough to fit into people's pockets. But uh, as you'll see, they're getting, getting there, as Machi will show you in a second. So, okay, so here's the, here's the, the, the end of this. The bottom line, as, as Americans say too often, is, um, is not the technology, it's not the economics as much, it's what, are people, what do people really want and how will you get their attention to get there? The Internet the economy is made for streaming and it's and it's made for on-demand distribution it's it's not made for show up at three o'clock and, and watch some show it's nobody's really interested in that uh, when I was a small child in 1960 uh, I went to the science museum in Philadelphia where I grew up and there there was this thing called a video phone and I could go in there and it was run AT&T which was the telephone monopoly uh, had this modern looking thing with a little television in it and uh, they had a similar one in Disneyland on the other side of America you know 5,000 kilometers away and you could sit there and look at some kid who was sitting there saying I have nothing to say <laughs> uh, so you know and then there's been other people since 1960 who have tried to, to sell video phones and there's still no video phones and the reason they don't exist is not technology the technology is 40 years old the reason, and it's not really economics anymore. People can do this stuff. Uh, it's just, nobody wants it. It doesn't, sol doesn't solve a problem. Uh, as I just said, streaming will, must and is and will get easier for users. They won't have to put up with Windows boxes or even Linux boxes, which is what I'm using. Um, we're, we're all just living through an early adopter phase where we pay the price uh, while we wait for the prices to go down. You know, it's like computers cost five times less than they used to and bandwidth costs 15 times less. Uh, you know, I'm, I have a huge amount of optimism. Things are getting much better. So just uh, stay up with us. Uh, 
you know, we're, we're basically doing what people want us to do. We're, uh, we're not just an evil company trying to uh, just sell things um, and uh, have fun along with us. Uh, I'd like to now follow with, with uh, Maciej, who will uh, show you some of our future. Good day, ladies and gentlemen. I'll just see three minutes presenting you present and future of streaming in mobile devices. This is physically shipping device, Nokia 7650, available on the uh, Polish market uh, with all GSM operators. And I would like to present mobile streaming over existing GSM network using existing GPRS transmission. I'll present you live TV station and uh, Jerry's uh, King FM. This is a very small device. It's very hard to see from the distance. I would like to invite you during the break. I can, I can show you this. <laughs> so this is, this is what the future is right now. This transmission is done with 20 kilobits per second. We can, we can deliver audio, we can deliver video, and there are commercial stations which are doing this streaming right now. This is the one thing. I invite you very kindly to come to me. I'll show you in front of you so you can see this very big screen what the quality uh, we can provide you. And the second good news is I'm here locally. Real Networks is a worldwide company, but we have local presence here in Poland. So if you have any questions, please do not hesitate to send me an email or just call my mobile number. I'm traveling across Eastern Europe, but as soon as I get access to internet, I try to answer all the emails immediately. And the last good thing is we are business enterprise. We are not uh, giving our staff for free. But for educational market, on Eastern Europe market, I can assure you that if you decide to buy anything from us, from Helix platform, you will get discount that we just cover our R&D cost. As Jerry showed, we've spent 200 millions on R&D, which actually costs. So this is our goodwill for you if you want to do something with ATVN together. Now this was produced on not on professional equipment, just on a, a little Linux box. Um, just put a DVD in, and uh, and, and basically uh, this is you know, 700 kilobits, is, which is just into, into broadband. And you know this is almost the past. This is done with our previous codex, but it looks it looks about the same to me. Uh, so in the future, I, you know I think it's very clear that movies will look like this. They will not. Uh, you know, it, it won't be big clunky VHS tapes and maybe not even DVD because with, with this kind of technology, uh, it's really no trouble to keep an inventory of say, you know, my, my dream for movies is that you can get a big movie guide at the bookstore, find some movie from 1945, find King Kong from 1933 and click on a button and, and watch it. 